Welcome back, everybody. The History Guy here. Ready for the big one, the Battle of Antietam. The bloodiest single day of combat in American history, even up to the present day. Um, was recently at the, the Antietam Battlefield. It's a powerful place to visit. Uh, it's very different than um, the Gettysburg Battlefield, for example. Gettysburg is very commercial. There's a lot of tourism industry that has grown up around that place. And, of course, tons of monuments everywhere. Antietam is much different. It's still a very small town. You get the sense that it's much more like it was in 1862 when this fight takes place. And, of course, the battlefield is very different as well. Um, very much rolling hills. There are very few places that are flat. Uh, and I'm going to post some links below. Uh, in the de description for this video, uh, just with a few of the short uh, video clips of some of my visit to the Antietam Battlefield, to places like Burnside Bridge down here, uh, I went to the National Cemetery, I went to the Dunker Church and the Sunken Road up here. Uh, but as for this battle, I am fighting in Brigadier General Difficulty. This is .95, that's the version of the game that I'm playing. You can see he's got 86,000 soldiers and 250 guns and 83 brigades. I have half that many brigades, uh, about 60, almost 68,000 men and 181 guns. And I'm going to try a strategy I have never tried before in this battle uh, on the left side. We'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and skip all of the instructions for now. Uh, typically, with a lot of these battles, the... Um, the gut reaction is to just do exactly what you're instructed to, to fill in the fortifications, etc. I'm not going to do that. I think the last time I fought this battle, I basically built a line right along in these woods, across the fortifications here, and then into these woods here. I'm going to try something much different. I don't know how it's going to go, but I thought it would be worth a try. So my goal here is to build a basically a reverse fish hook right down uh, in these woods right here, which means I'm basically going to be holding right at the objective. There are two objectives, three objectives. The town of Sharpsburg, which doesn't open up until the very end of the battle. The Sunken Road and Dunker Church. Sunken, uh, Sunken Road and Dunker Church uh, are here on the left side of the battlefield. And then, of course, the town of Sharpsburg is basically on the, on the right side uh, of my line. So, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by... Building up the line right here. Uh, let me see what I've got as far as guns go. These are my 10-pounder parrots, which I'm going to put eh, maybe like back here. And then I've got these other 10-pounders as well. And I'm basically going to keep both of those in the center. Um, and then as things open up, I will extend the line. Uh, across the sunken road. We'll see how that all goes. I'm actually going to bring Crocker back as a reserve unit. And what I'm hoping will happen is that he'll just kind of come right down the center through where all these fortifications are. Uh, and when the second part of the battlefield opens up down here, I'll have this line that extends down this way and then across like this. And I'll have a nice open field of fire that I hope he will come down into. Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of casualties no matter how I do this. And I'm outnumbered by about 20,000 men, but I feel like uh, this should give me a good chance to win the battle. And inflict a lot of casualties in the process. Let's see if I can move up a little bit and still keep the same cover. I think I'm going to break off some skirmishers from Crocker and bring them out here somewhere just for, for now. Of course, they secured Nicodemus Hill, which is fine. I'm not going to contest that. I'm not going to sit up there in the open and hold try to hold that. And here he comes. You can see all of the early forces that he's got in place here. I'm going to drop Ransom back so he's in a little better cover. And I've got a ton of supplies. I think I've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 supplies between my three core in this battle. 
and I know especially on the left I'm going to need every bit of them because these guys are going to be engaged for a long time. This is where my heaviest casualties are going to be is probably right, right in here in the center of this part of the line. Some of these units are going to suffer severely. I have no doubt of that. So I'm holding back two brigades basically as reserves because I think at some point some of these brigades are going to suffer heavy casualties and I'll need to push them up a little bit. I'm trying to decide whether it makes sense to keep these guns firing the whole time. Not entirely sure that's the best use of my supplies. I want to look and see at these frontline units what they have as far as guns. So we've got some Harper, Harper's Ferry 1855s right here. All right, well, that was fast. Probably because Nicodemus Hill was taken. All right, so now we get our second wave of our forces. And this is where it gets interesting. And, I, and I, I've done this part of the strategy before. At some point, he's going to have a bunch of units that attempt to cross this center bridge here. I don't want to allow that to happen too easily. I'm actually going to put these 24-pounders right down in there. They may suffer some casualties in the process, but they're going to cause all kinds of havoc. Uh, I'm also going to send my howitzers down there. Get them up here a little bit higher, I think. Now, he always seems to get his first brigade of um, cavalry through here, so I'm going to put a unit up here just to cover that because that first one will sneak across and try to break loose to get up that way. So I want to have somebody in place for that. And so basically what I'm going to do is I'll line up enough men to destroy everything that tries to cross this bridge. Once all of them are destroyed, I'm going to pull that line back and then the, the end of my line is basically going to extend down this way right here. And the reason for that is once the last part of the battle, the Burnside Bridge part opens up, this all opens up over here and suddenly there's a bunch of men there and they will wreak havoc on these guys guarding the bridge. So I found it's better to pull them back. I can pull these skirmishers back. In fact, I'll just go ahead and reattach them to their line. All right, we'll send General Jackson down here as well. I think 10,000 men should be enough to hold that position effectively. All right, let's see what's happening up here. Looks like he's advancing his first brigades. The Louisiana Tigers, they've got 1853 Enfields. Orphan Brigade's got Harper's Ferry 1855s. He's going to have a lot of artillery firing down on these guys, but being in the trees, I'm hoping will provide some cover from that. So up on this left side in an area known as the cornfield. Um, I'm trying to look here. Is this the Dunker Church here? So if I'm orient, uh, orienting myself correctly, this being the Dunker Church, this would be the cornfield right here. Um, and this was one of the bloodiest places on earth. Um, in a span of a few hours, I think about 8,000 men fell in that cornfield. Uh, out of about 27,000 engaged, if I remember right. Some incredible acts of heroism that took place there. This might be the sunken road, actually. But I'm just, I'm just trying to remember this from my own visit to the battlefield, kind of where things were, because you have the... The cornfield is to the... Uh, if you're looking at the Dunker Church from this direction, it's to the, to the right of the Dunker Church, and then the sunken roads further to the right of that. 
But I, like I said, I visited that. I shot some video when I was there. You can check those out. All right, so not a lot happening at the moment. Looks like he's starting to move some of his artillery over this way. I gotta be ready over here though, because I know what's coming. Let's get Brooke up here on this side. I'm gonna lose a lot of men doing this because they'll fire on me pretty heavily, but I'm gonna cause a lot more casualties than what I lose. I'm gonna move these howitzers up here. They'll take some casualties as well, but these are pretty much the cheapest guns that I have. For the most part, he's kind of avoiding a general engagement so far. Antietam's been portrayed in a few different battles, or in a few different movies. Uh, there are some deleted scenes from Gods and Generals that show the fight in the cornfield. Uh, of course, uh, the movie Glory, back in the late 1980s, which uh, was very highly regarded by critics. Fantastic film, if you've never seen it, definitely check it out. Uh, Denzel Washington won his first Oscar for that role. Excellent film about the, uh, the 54th Massachusetts, which was one of the very first African-American regiments to see action in the war. So Antietam had about 23,000 casualties, which for a single-day battle was uh, the bloodiest of the war in terms of that, and actually bloodiest in, in, in history, as I've mentioned. It was the first large-scale engagement that actually took place outside of the Confederacy, uh, taking place just across the Potomac River into Maryland, which did not secede. The amazing thing was that McClellan basically had a two-to-one advantage in manpower and did not use it. He uh, he didn't commit a lot of his forces, and he could have won a significant victory if he had committed much more of his men in this fight. So a lot of artillery fire coming down on the sunken road now. Sunken road, again, was a very bloody scene of the battle. Uh, Confederate General John Gordon was wounded, I think, five times defending this area. Took a terrible wound to his face, which scarred him for the rest of his life. Israel Richardson, who was a Union Division commander leading the attack on the sunken road, he was mortally wounded. About 87,000 Union soldiers present at the battle. Uh, lost about 12,000 casualties. Confederates lost about 10,000 out of about 40,000 that they had present and engaged. Alright, so here comes that cavalry unit that I mentioned. They just rode through and lost about 200 men doing so. And now here comes the rest. So we'll keep post, just kind of watching the north here in case Farnsworth comes back down on me. And bye-bye to that cavalry unit who's going to disappear here very soon. Whoa, where are you going, 24-pounders? Hang tight. So I'm going to bottle all these guys up here. Hayes is going to take a lot of casualties, but I'm basically going to destroy couple of batteries of artillery, several brigades of infantry and cavalry, and make my job a whole lot easier. And in the meantime, 
he's finally, it looks, looks like, uh, gonna launch an attack on my left. Alright, so we've got ammo issues already with the artillery. That's to be expected when they fire that much. I'm gonna keep everybody well supplied here. He's firing on these 10 pounders. They've lost a lot of men. But the more his artillery fires on my 10 pounders, the less they're firing on other people, so. Uh, maybe I should move them up so they're in better cover. The, uh, politically, this battle was important because um, Abraham Lincoln had made the decision earlier in 1862 to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which was a war measure. Um, it was meant to be a way of... Um, Number one, giving the Union something else to fight for just besides Union. Uh, but also to uh, be able to justify confiscating the property, as it was considered by the South, um, of the South, and destroy their ability to make war. Okay, my 24-pounders are getting hammered. And so he wanted to issue this Emancipation Proclamation, which would free all of the slaves in areas of the country that were in rebellion against the United States. Basically, he was freeing the slaves in all the places where we did not have jurisdiction, uh, the, we being the United States. But it, um, it, it was probably rightly so perceived by members of Lincoln's cabinet as seeming desperate uh, at the time that he made the decision, which was right around the time of the uh, Peninsula Campaign, the Seven Days, which went very badly for the Union. And so several of his members of his cabinet wisely suggested that Lincoln wait for a military victory on the battlefield and then issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And of course Antietam was hardly a significant victory, but uh, strategically it was a victory because it stopped Lee's invasion of the North, it sent him back into his own territory, and Lincoln decided that was good enough. And he issued the Emancipation Proclamation to take effect on January 1st. So that was probably the most significant thing to come out of Antietam. Alright, so once we are able to destroy all these units, then I will pull all these forces back. We just gotta keep the pressure on them, keep firing on them, and eventually they'll be destroyed. Let's see what's happening over here. Honestly, he, I mean, he has not even attempted a major push. I pretty much decimated this battery right here. These 10-pounders are taking it pretty hard. Um, but that's okay. Alright, so for now, I'll just keep an eye on the mini-map, and I'll mainly just watch what's happening over here. And I'm going to go ahead and speed things up a little bit. They're not getting off that bridge. A couple of these units are about to disappear. I probably should have kept these 24 pounders back to begin with. They're still pretty effective and this way they're not taking casualties. Got plenty of time, hour and a half left. Like I said, I, I've got to be cautious and make sure that I pull back once I've destroyed all these forces. And then I should be able to hold out to the end of the battle. Right now he's got about 9,000 men more than me on the field. Here we go, that one disappeared. Two more brigades left more Union divisions appearing on the field. I mean, he's stacked pretty deep over here. If he would just push really hard in one spot, he could probably overcome me, but he's not going to do that. He's being very McClellan-like in that way. Where he's got the might, but he's not using it. Alright, let's finish these guys off. Just one brigade left. I wonder if we could uh, get him to surrender. 
Yeah, it looks like he'll probably dissolve rather than surrender. Oh, he did surrender. Excellent. There's some prisoners. All right, let's get those guys up here. Once they've cleared out, I'm going to pull this line back. I'll go take a look up here real quick. I just want to see how my brigades are holding up. Louisiana Tigers taking a lot of casualties. Nobody else really taking anything significant at the moment. Okay. Now we pull this line back to right here. And then we will get some additional forces. My third corps, which doesn't have a lot in it. But it'll have enough to be able to cover the town of Sharpsburg. Alright, so far I feel like this is going pretty well. We'll see what happens at the end. But he's basically holding back. I imagine once the whole battlefield opens up, he'll start pushing more. I'm going to put these howitzers over here. Maybe the 24-pounders as well. Okay, here comes the last part of the fight. Now, um, Burnside Bridge, something obviously people hear a lot about. It's one of the most famous parts of the battlefield. Um, I have to be honest with you. Until you actually go there and see it, you really can't get a sense of how it is that a couple of hundred men uh, from Georgia were able to hold this bridge against an entire Union division or more uh, trying to cross. But it's a narrow bridge, and this area right on the other side is really high. Um, and it's a fantastic defensive location. What ended up happening was the Union actually got around and found a place that they could ford the stream over here. And they were able to get up on the flank. Um, also a little known thing. Uh, and there is a monument right here just behind and up the hill on Burnside Bridge. Uh, there's a monument to future President William McKinley. Who uh, served, I think he might have only been a sergeant at the time. I think he eventually rose to be an officer. Um, I could be wrong about his rank at the battle, but he was located in this part of the battlefield at Antietam. Uh, I don't think he was the only future president who was there, but I don't want to uh, be quoted on that because I could be wrong. But for some reason I was thinking that McKinley and Rutherford B. Hayes were in the same unit. Of course, they were both um, governors of Ohio and both presidents. And my uh, great, 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 great grandfather's brother actually built the house that William McKinley was born in, in Niles, Ohio, which is actually my wife's hometown and very close to where I grew up. Alright, so here comes an attack. In fact, he already hit my line at the sunken road. Yeah, we're going to get these 24-pounders over here. So this is the final phase of the battle. Three objectives to be held. Sharpsburg, Sunken Road, Dunker Church. Sunken Road right here, Dunker Church up here. At some point, I imagine he'll launch a major assault right here. He may even temporarily take that Sunken Road or the Dunker Church, but he won't hold it. Oh, I got a brigade down here. I got to be careful. Oh, he's covering that fort I was just talking about. This is where they ended up fording the stream.
Okay. We'll just kind of keep an eye out here for now. Looks like he's going to launch an attack on this part of the line as well. Alright, let's uh, resupply. Make sure everybody's got the supplies they need to finish this battle. Wow, these 10 pounders took a, be took a beating. Alright, he currently has about 13,500 more men than I do. twice as many guns. And I know at some point there's going to be a major assault right here at my center. I'm actually going to go ahead and bring Law down over here. Because he's not really hitting my left. Alright, let's get over here and replenish them. I'm going to keep these sharpshooters back in the town just in case he decides to get fancy and sneak somebody up there. Let's send Torbert out here. Might be able to start rolling up his flank. All right, he's getting in position. He, he definitely looks like somebody who's about to launch a major assault all along the left side. I'm going to move Brewster out, but very cautiously, just keeping an eye out. But I'm, I'm going to try to get a shot or two into Weber's flank here. As I tr try to do the same over here for Devin. I have to remember now, it's not good enough just to win the battles. Now we need to try and inflict casualties as much as possible. Uh, I don't want to do anything reckless to lose a lot of men. But if I see little opportunities like this right here, where I can get into somebody's flank, cause additional casualties, I'm going to take that opportunity. I'm going to get a shot here in Stainrook, but then I'm probably going to back Brewster off because I'm in a kind of a pre precarious position there. Hold on, Brewster. That's far enough. Let's get another volley off. Once he fires one more volley, I'm going to back him up. Doesn't seem to be doing enough damage. Alright, let's see what's going on back down here on the right. Couldn't quite get around on Devin's flank as he turned. But that's alright. Anytime I'm inflicting significantly more casualties than I'm taking... Those are good times. All right, there's some artillery over there. Let's go ahead and back up. He's getting closer and closer. I just feel like in the next four hours, there's something going to happen here. He had a 13,500 man advantage on me. Let's see where that stands now. That's about 12,200. 
So as long as that number keeps decreasing, I know I'm inflicting more casualties than I'm taking. Oh, I gotta watch Hayes here. Wow. That's a lot of men in one spot. Yeah, and Hayes is paying for it. Alright, what can I do about that? Because Hayes is never going to be able to hold like that. Right, I'm going to drop Forrest back to cover the town, bring these sharpshooters up on this hill. I think I can bring Torbert around. Got to get Hayes some help. And I don't want to bring Brown up because that's going to expose Brown's flank. There goes Hayes. Understandably so. Alright, let's see what's happening up here. They're sitting so close, but they're not advancing. I don't quite understand that. Probably because they don't... Oh, wow. Everybody's shifting. I think a big attack's coming. These guys have suffered a lot of casualties, too. I'm just trying to disrupt things over here a little bit. Not the best use of cavalry by any means. But I'm trying to disrupt his battle plan. And it seems to be working. Hold up, Brown. Alright, Vaughn, get out of there. Get out of there, Vaughn. I'm going to lose that brigade of cavalry. Darn it. Now he's going up toward the supplies. Interesting. But it did the trick. It disrupted his attack over here. And that was the aim. Now back to what's happening up here. Scoop Brewster up, get some extra fire on this brigade here. Where's my cavalry? I'm going to lose these guys. Well, in the meantime, they're wreaking havoc on some artillery. But as soon as they take a couple shots of canister, they're done. Whoa, Grover, where are you going, buddy? swing these guys around. Three on one here with these brigades. We should be able to cause Harlan to back back up. Ammo issues again. There we go. Wow, nice. Oh, how did he get routed? Uh, I tried to pull him back and he routed, but good day for him. 415 kills, 35 deaths. Still three hours to go. My poor cavalry, Vaughn. They valiantly sacrificed themselves for the sake of disrupting the attacks on my right flank. Alright, let's go back and reoccupy the defensive position at Burnside Bridge.
He doesn't seem to be pressing an attack, which is interesting. Um, hmm. Not quite sure what to make of that. I know I'm about to destroy this battery, though. As well as Fairchild. Alright, we'll go ahead and occupy that position. And let's just keep pressing this line forward. I'm a little nervous about the number of men I've got defending the, the sunken road here. I feel like I'm going to need more than this. Let's do this. Let's pull Haney out. Put Gibson in right there. Move Haney over to this side. I don't think he knows what to do with me holding this strange defensive alignment that I've got. Good day for the 24 pounders, 1200 kills. Oh, I think my cavalry survived. In fact, now they're in a pretty interesting position. Don't fire. No oh, wait, those aren't supplies. Those are that's a battery. Yeah, you can fire on them. I feel like this is the first time I've fought the Battle of Antietam where I I didn't feel I was precariously close to possibly losing the battle. And the supplies are mine. Thank you. Of course, the question is, what do I do with them? I'm pretty much just going to have to hold them over here, I guess. I'm going to send Grover over here just to be safe. And the sharpshooters. Hey there, General Burnside. Let me go ahead and kill you now and put you out of your misery so you don't have to command the Union debacle that's coming at Fredericksburg.
Alright, it doesn't even look like he's going to attempt an attack on my left. I'm going to speed things up here for a minute. You gotta be careful with Brown because there's a possible exposed flank here. Uh, and he got routed because of it. And here comes a brigade from Harland. I gotta be careful there. I may end up losing these supplies back. That's okay. Not a huge deal. Here comes a major assault on the sunken road. I gotta watch that. In fact, he just routed my unit, which means the howitzers are in danger now, and he's gonna press that attack. I got the supplies through. And actually, now that Torbert is reorganized, it's actually to my advantage that he's across that bridge. He can come up here and hit Harland. General Longstreet has been killed. Wow. Over here defending the sunken road. Well, there's a history change for you. James Longstreet. A lot of people don't realize just how much that poor man suffered. Um, I believe, I could be wrong about this, but I know um, at the very least, I think a few of his children died right around the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. I think it was yellow fever or something like that. may have been his wife as well. But I know it was just brutal what happened to him. And after the war, he actually became a Republican, which was a pretty big no-no for a former Confederate. And he took a lot, of, a lot of flack for that. As well as his speaking out against some of the decisions that Robert E. Lee made. And of course, Robert E. Lee, who died not long after the Civil War, um, was one of those people that just was revered universally across the South. He actually served briefly as the United States Minister to the Ottoman Empire. A uh, little tidbit for you on James Longstreet. That was in 1880-81, so I guess that would have been um, under Rutherford B. Hayes. It doesn't look like there's going to be an attack on the objective here. Wow, look at that Grover. 2,400 kills, 1,100 deaths. They have just been pummeled. This is where I expected that the major casualties were going to happen up here. But these units, by and large, are intact. It's the sunken road that he decided to go after hard. And that's where my major casualties are happening. So we're going to try and get in here and try to support these guys before they break. There goes Grover. I'm going to send Law down here. Because this, this is a precarious situation. So my comments about how I hadn't really suffered uh, anywhere to make me worry about being able to win the battle. Well, here we go. Sunken Road's where he's going to try and make his stand. And make it happen.
a lot of people would argue, going back to Longstreet, that he was one of the most capable corps commanders in the war on either side. Maybe the most capable. Obviously Stonewall Jackson probably up there as well, but a lot of where Jackson made his fame for himself was in command of an independent army in the Shenandoah Valley. Oh, here we come. I mean, he's throwing everything he's got at the sunken road. All right, let's get Law right in over here. We're going to push this line up. Yep, he's pouring everybody right into that spot. Makes sense, he just should have probably done it a lot sooner. There's an hour and 12 minutes to go. Okay, he's uh, still got about 11,000 more men than I do. But I think we withstood his best chance at overrunning the sunken road. Keep one close eye over here on the town of Sharpsburg. Make sure he doesn't do something fishy there. But I think we're in solid shape. I'm going to go ahead and speed this up. Whoa, post. Back up. There's one brigade sitting over here. I just got to keep one eye on him. Oh, maybe I'm advancing a little too far here. But it's taking the pressure off. And also inflicting extra casualties. All right, half hour to go. We've got this. He's shoving more units over this way. All right, we'll back off. That's fine. I was just trying to buy some time, inflict some extra casualties, and take the pressure off the sunken road a little bit, and that did the trick, so. Nine minutes to go. I feel pretty good about this victory. Um, obviously, there's always things I could have done better, and I, I certainly welcome your input on that, so please let me know what you see that maybe I overlooked or maybe I could have done differently. And wow, here comes his last second 
desperate charge at the objective. But there we have the Battle of Antietam. So let's take a look. Uh, Y'all numbered me by 20,000 men. I suffered 12,000 casualties, which is actually pretty in line with what the Confederates lost, although a smaller percentage because I had more men than the Confederates engaged in this battle. Um, missing cavalry, guns. Uh, a good day. I I'm happy with this. I probably could have done some things differently a little bit with some of my artillery, but um, this is nice. Um, just looking here at the uh, number of 1855 Harper's Ferry guns that I grabbed. Um, rescued a lot of weapons as well. Uh, rescued four of my 24-pounders, so that's good because I, I wasn't happy about losing those. Captured 13 Napoleons, so all in all, uh, I'm very happy with this and how it turned out. Let's take a look and see just real briefly because I know this has been a long video already. Um, just take a look and see how things look after the battle. I got Robert E. Lee, so there's a new there's a lieutenant general uh, that I will actually. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put Lee in front of my second in charge of my second corps. And then I'll move uh, Stonewall Jackson over to my third corps. But uh, a lot of refitting to do, obviously. But I've got 20,000 troops available, plus the 52,000 or so I already have. Um, his army size basically stayed the same. So, But we'll come back and revisit all of this afterwards. Like I said... I welcome your comments, your questions, your observations, any and all things. Check out some of my videos from my visit to Antietam. If you'd hit thumbs up, I'd greatly appreciate it. Subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you again very soon. Have a great week.